for a little bit of coolness in this building, God, because there's times when you walk in this building, summertime, and it's just baking. Uh, so, God, I thank you for the cool air that's blowing through here. Uh, God, we thank you for the opportunity, the privilege, and the honor that you give us to be able to stand and sing, to gather together, uh, to say thank you to you, uh, and to praise our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, so, Father, today as we stand and we sing, may we just remember and reflect upon the real the real reality of what you've saved us from, and that we would sing with a grateful heart, and that God, later when we open up your word, that your word would speak to us, that it would help us to uh, deepen our walk with you and to dig our roots deeply into you, and that God, it would be through that process that, Father, we would be able to live out a genuine Christian faith, that others would see real love, real forgiveness, real grace and mercy in action, and the truth of Jesus Christ on display. So God, we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's stand and sing a little bit.
song called Everlasting Love, God. Strength will rise when we wait upon the Lord. Amen. What a great message that has.
I love that song because it's the, it's the sound of what Jesus was hearing when he came into Jerusalem as king. I love that. We're just proclaiming him today as our King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Amen.
time to worship is worship. This was awesome today. So we're going to have the kids come forward, okay? And as we do that, we got an announcement that we wanted to have Chris make, and then Tony, when you're ready, come on down. How many know that our church used to own the Roxy at theater, and we had youth group and all kinds of stuff down there for many years, and then Nick Castlestrom, who used to be a part of our church, and then set out to be a pastor and started his own church. And Nick uh, bought the church from us. So it's kind of neat because it's still in the family. And uh, Nick is going to have a, a, a you, if you've seen the, um, the flyer out in the vestibule, uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, he's doing something Friday night. If you have anybody that you're trying to witness to, this is definitely for them because he's going to Make it clear. Uh, he's going to make it clear uh, exactly what salvation is, how it happens, and what takes place. And we have somebody make a coffin. Yeah, somebody make a coffin. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so we had somebody make a coffin. And I think that'll be quite interesting because he's going to demonstrate how we have to die. He died for us. We have to die to self. So if you have anybody that you are witnessing to, and you, come. Uh, I think it's going to be very interesting. I want to share something really neat. He texted me this morning, and uh, he, he told me he was up in the room. He has uh, the upper part of the Roxy. He, he made it to a war room. I don't know how many of you saw the movie, War Room. Yeah. But he made it into a war room, and that's a good He discovered, as he was praying, the Lord showed him that the address of the Roxy is 714 May. He's having this thing Friday night, and it's 714 July. Yeah, 14. And what's really neat, he said, just this week, because we've always said, because the Roxy is 714 May, we've always said, someday, maybe in the last days, maybe when things are really tough, it's going to be a place of prayer. We all have believed that for many years. And sometimes God has to wait, you know, until it's time. So Nick has kept this prayer going. And he's having having prayer down at the Roxy on Wednesday night at 6.30 if you'd like to go. Um, it's, it'll be wonderful. And I think our country's in bad enough shape. We really need to be praying together. So you're welcome to come to the Roxy upstairs at 6.30 Wednesday night. But anyway, he said... It's so interesting because just this week he put up a plaque, Second Chronicles 714. And I want to read that to you if you're not familiar with it. Great. Uh, this is Second Chronicles 714. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer, and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up in heaven, that there be no more rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. In other words, if things start getting really bad, are things getting really bad in this country? Yes. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves to pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. And that's one of my favorite scriptures. And of course, we all knew that scripture when we bought the Roxy. By the way, the Roxy, we paid a dollar to Roxy. Our, our youth group went down, laid hands on the Roxy because it was empty. And God gave us the Roxy. The people that owned the Roxy sold it to us for one dollar. So it was a gift from God. And we don't, we really want it, it, it used in the way that God wants it to be used as a place of prayer. So as time goes on, I'm hoping it will become a place of prayer. But you're invited Wednesday night to sit as a prayer at and then again, Friday night, and bring people to meet the Lord. Thanks, Chris. Do you need this or anything? Yeah. <laughs> 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 See, I mean, that was a stupid question. <laughs> no stupid All right. Um, 
couple things. A couple things. Uh, youth group's going to be canceled until August. Was it August 9th? September. September. Yeah. Sorry. September. We're going to take August off. Uh, we still haven't found anyone to take care of the media room for uh, August. If we can't, uh, because I'm just going to take a sabbatical. Um, this uh, week, I'm going to be heading right after church to Camp Alaka. I'm going to be speaking to a whole youth group all week, about two to three times a day. So if you can keep me in prayer for that, too, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. I lost all my notes. But you know, last time God did that, boy, it took off. Because I have a precognition of what's supposed to happen. And he says, really? So, he's kids, right? Um, the other thing, too, um, in August, we're going to start some uh, other ministries as well. Uh, I'm going to do, it's funny that you bring up the war room. We're going to do a Bible study on the war room in our small group that meets here every Wednesday. Um, Tuesday. Is that as growing up? Tuesday. Tuesday, sorry, Tuesday. We sent you for. Is that in August or September or October? <laughs> <laughs> hey, can you come down and get back? That's, that's my day runner up there. I don't know if you guys old school remember day runners or no pads. Uh, anyways, we're going to do the war room study. Uh, growing up, I was always a fighter. I wasn't much. I had a lot of anger issues and stuff like that. And I, I thought, so when I did finally submit my life to Christ, I thought I was going to be one of those warriors on the front line with the sword slashing and dashing and taking care of the demons old school, right? He's got me on the mountain praying like Moses did. And he's working well. So, uh, you guys are coming. <laughs> I get emotional because of the Holy Spirit really has worked in my life. And continues. Sorry, you guys just see me preach. <laughs> Try and fight back the tears because God just tells me things sometimes that I need to share and it just overwhelms me because for him to speak to me, uh, he been, well, he been, I already remember Paul saying, you know, yeah, he was the worst of all. And now, look what he does. And so, I was not a good kid. <laughs> so, for him to use me now in, in, the, in the capacity that actually I allow him to use because we can fight him. We can definitely fight him. But we have to really give in to him. And to do that, we have to pray. We read the word and we pray. And prayer is one of the best things to combat the, the evil, to combat the Satan, yeah, to combat everything that he does. Because I am almost 99.9% .9 positive that the reason why I'm here today is because my great-grandmother so, August, I'm taking off. September, we're going to start the, the youth group up again, and we'll start meeting volunteers again and stuff like that. So, if you guys can think about that, please come see me if you guys can do anything with the media law. Not to mention any names unless. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, let's pray over our kids and they'll, we'll discuss that. Okay, join me. God, we are grateful. For this little church family, God, that you do mighty things for it. Lord, we do lift up Tony as he goes up to Alaka to work and to speak and to minister to and to be ministered to as well. God, we pray over our children today and the teachers. We ask God that you would continue to put yourself on display to their hearts and that the lessons would be about how much you love us and what you call us to. And that is to live out your truth for our love. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. We're going to get married. We're ready for the offering. I always forget this, you know. I love being in a church that reminds me about offering. Usually, if I was sitting out there with you back in my days of not being up here, I would really know I'd probably be nervous. Isn't that bad? Yeah. 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 But this church always reminds me. So if we could have a our offering. Are you ready? I'm going to pray real quick over our offering. God, we thank you. Thank you for reminding uh, this whole line. Uh, Lord, we ask that you use this money 
uh, the funds and finances that you provide to us in a way that we can reach beyond these doors as well as the minister within. That God, you would hold us accountable to what you provide. And Father, as your word says, may we give back a portion with a glad and cheerful heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, George. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That last song that we sang about the presence, um, what it's going to be like to stand in his presence, like, I, I just, I can't even fathom what that's going to be like. I get goosebumps when I listen to this kind of worship going on. Uh, a long time ago, 20 plus years ago, living in Portland, Oregon, downtown, uh, where all the NBA teams would come and stay at our office in downtown. And I walked into this hotel for a lunch, it was the Marriott, and out of the elevator came Shaquille O'Neal. And Shaquille O'Neal is, is at least this tall. And, and he just kind of looked down at me like I was nothing. Which he didn't know. I was nothing at that point. You know, I still am. But, I mean, I looked at him and his feet looked like they were this huge. And they might have been. But I just remember being in, in kind of a moment of awe. One of the physical nature of this guy. The presence that he had as he stepped off of the elevator. As well as being an NBA famous player. And as we sang that song, I thought about being in God's presence. We fawn all over professional athletes, college athletes. We fawn all over them. And yet there's going to come a time when the very presence of our God will buckle our knees. And we will be overwhelmed with how much He loves us. How incredible He has taken the care that He's taken of us. How many times He's reached out and said, it's okay. Come on, back up. Let's go for this. And just to be in the presence of a God who could snuff my life out, yet loves me enough to go to the cross and say, I want you with me. I want you with me. That's, that's just phenomenal to think about. Um, I don't know whether to do this before or after I'm done with this sermon. I just don't know where, whether to do it before or after. Um, what should I do? Do it now. That's all I needed. Thank you. Sometimes in indecision you follow some wisdom. So I'm going to do it now. Okay? For the last almost five years, almost five years of the young, I don't know, if you've been here a long a while, okay, I've been here for, I don't remember how long, we've got eight, nine years, something like that. Um, a young man came by the name of Tony Smith. And with Tony Smith, he was a college student in the nursing program. With, with Tony came a group of college kids. They occupied two, three, four rows. It was awesome. And then he left and we went, and the college kids left. And we thought, what are we going to do? And God, in this sense of humor, brought not just this person, but a few others. But this person was one of the first ones to start coming here. And uh, she's been here for almost five years now. And she's leaving us. This is her last day here with us. No. no. Did you hear that? Uh, George McFarland uh, graduated from our program along with Jasmine Smith. And her husband, Chris, is still uh, plugging away, but he'll be down soon, too. Um, but Jordan will be leaving, and, and our prayer is that she's going to Thailand. Uh, she's got a, a couple weeks ago it was that she kind of shared what she's doing. It's been probably longer than that. That she's going to a, a missionary school uh, to teach, uh, and that's her goal. That's her hope. Uh, one of the things I'm going to share with you is that she, uh, God is, is is in control of this fundraising. I know that, and right now I know that Jordan is a little bit um, disappointed just because. She, She's underneath the mark she's supposed to be at. And that, we're not sure what that means, other than God is still in control. We'll trust that. Uh, maybe she'll be back here. <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's, 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 I, I would be okay with that. Um, but I know that God will do whatever it is that she needs and the place that she will be used the most. And I know wherever that's at, this young lady's heart that loves well will touch and minister to people around. So what we're going to do right now, and if you've, ever, if you've been here long enough, you know that when we have departures like this, and people leaving and, and moving on and doing great things, that we end up having a time of prayer over this person. So, I can't tell you how much I love this young lady. I love her deeply. Now I'll put him on. She has filled my heart, my encouragement uh, at the college, just by how she has operated on campus, how she's fulfilled ministry with crew, Campus Crusade for Christ. She started the one down here at LC, uh, and it's a phenomenal one. And uh, she has been blessed by you all as well. 
She's been somebody who has uh, reached out and, and started lots of different things. We had a college group for a while of probably 15 to 20 students. It was awesome downstairs meeting every other week. Um, and I just want us to pray over her. So if you are so led, um, you can come on up and gather around this young lady, sharing her, her love for you and also your love for her. If you're not comfortable with this, don't worry. You can stay where you're at. But I just want you to all come up and gather around this young woman for the, what she's endeavoring to do now.
And uh, because we see his name there as well as the book of Colossians. Um, we know also that Paul is writing from a prison in Rome when he writes this. Uh, and, and he writes the letter uh, to the Colossians, but he also pens this letter to his good friend, his, his compadre, his fellow worker, Philemon. And there's several kind of concepts or themes that run through this that I think are vitally important for us. I don't know that we're all often, at least I'll speak about myself, sometimes I forget just how incredible the experience and the reality of being redeemed by Christ is. Sometimes, I don't want to say I take it for granted, but sometimes I move through life without, without really realizing the depths of hell that I was in that he pulled me out of. And that's an incredible reality. The next one is this, this idea of refreshment through forgiveness. Don't raise your hand, but anybody in here struggle with forgiveness? I think we all do, which is why I think we read about it in Scripture that we're not just to forgive once or twice or 10 or 50 or 60 times. 70 times 7. Continue to forgive and forgive and forgive. And there is a point in here in which the message or the theme or the concept behind it is that we gain refreshment when we forgive. When we forgive someone, we gain refreshment of being released from the poison. And that's what we're going to hear. Not only do we refresh the person that we're forgiving, but many times that person doesn't even know that something's against them. But we refresh others who might be around them or around them. Another thing is that we need encouragement for the work. Tony's going to take a sabbatical in August. And there's no question that we do need somebody up there. <laughs> Anybody wants to be trained in between now and then to go up and, and learn how to operate up in that, in the law. And the final message of this, um, this short book is that we are called to love each other well. We are called to love each other well. Well, not just pretend, not just to be a phony Christian, not just to profess it one day a week, not just to kind of blurt out the scriptures, but to, to, to act and to behave and to be people who love others well. I think it was St. Francis of Assisi that says, told a, one of his uh, mentees to go out into the, the city, the community, and preach. And if you need to, use words. We're called to love ones. We're called to love and treat others well. To live a genuine faith. And what we're going to read about is that Philemon is being written to by Paul regarding Onesimus. And who Onesimus was. They both know Onesimus. And it's interesting because Onesimus, as we're going to read about, was a worthless, no good, scoundrel slave. Who stole from Philemon and ran away. Not just a scoundrel kind of slave, but a thief. Somebody that the people in Colossia and around the areas, and especially Philemon, would probably, if they ever got their hands on him, would maybe strangle him, definitely put him in jail. And he runs away to Rome. And I wonder who he meets in Rome. God's plans are always way above, far ahead, always around us. Onesimus runs to Rome. And I would imagine that his goal or his, his idea was, I'm, I know I'm in trouble if I go back. I cannot be seen by those people. I'm going to run to Rome, this huge metropolis, urban sprawl, and I will disappear. At some point, he's arrested in his own prison. Guess who he gets to know or comes to know better? And it's the Apostle Paul. Maybe he sought him out. Maybe Onesimus, from all of his uh, uh, slave times, under Philemon, heard about and maybe heard Paul every now and then, and sought him out because he was at the bottom of the barrel. We also discover that through Paul's loving witness, Onesimus, as we'll read, comes to salvation in Christ. And I'm going to tell you that Paul watched a slave who was a scoundrel, who was a thief, who lived a lie, who lived a uh, with unprincipled, no principles in his life, thrown in jail. And it was one of those times in which somebody in jail gave their life to Christ. Have you ever heard that? People who have gone to prison, they come to know Jesus Christ. Sometimes I think in general, in the general population, we go, that person is just using this as a way to maybe get out. Paul had the chance not just to witness and to bring this guy to Christ, but to watch him from that moment forward. 
to see the genuine nature of his faith, to see the actual demonstration of from a darkened heart, hardened heart, selfish heart, to one that was changed and transformed by the love, the love and the power of Paul, but by the power of the Holy Spirit who gave his life to Christ. Paul doesn't take this kind of stuff lightly. As we've read in numerous big books that Paul has written, he takes salvation seriously. That it's not a phony, kind of weak thing that we just talk about, but it's lived out. And so this conversion from the business had to be genuine. Something that, as we're going to read, filled up Paul's heart and encouraged him. Paul is sending Onesimus back to Philemon, which is going to be kind of an, uh, an interesting kind of dialogue as we watch this. And this is the other thing I gather from this book. Remember, I don't know if you've been here a while, you know that we took probably eight to ten, maybe longer months going through the Roman, the book of Romans, the Roman road. It was an awesome journey through the Roman road. And it's deep with theology, deep with doctrine, deep with all kinds of practical applications to us. I read as a prayer at the very end of Romans 8 last week. That absolutely what can separate us from the love of God? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God. That's an incredible thing. But this letter demonstrates God's intense love for individuals and individuals. Families. Yeah, absolutely he's concerned about countries and nations and peoples and large churches, small churches, but he is intensely concerned and loves and cares for individual families and individuals. And that's what I gather from this book. It's an incredible testimony of how much God loves us because not only is he absolutely concerned for the larger picture, but he's concerned about the smaller pictures of each of us. Absolutely involved with. I think we know that. I know that in my head. But this book brought it home to me that this God of ours is on top of every aspect of our life and desires that intimate relationship with each of us. So, and, and I'll break this up as I read it. But let's start with uh, verse one, of chapter one. But there's only one chapter. It is chapter one. Good. <laughs> Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon. Our, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. I want you to hear that. To the church in your house. Let that speak to you. I, 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 when I read that this morning again, it just hit me. came at me like a, uh, you know, just a big wound. As I sat outside my house, he was speaking to me about my church in my house. Each of you, when you walk into your home, you are walking into your church, where you minister, where you serve. Is it characterized by love? Is it characterized by a desire to dispense grace, to teach about the truth of Christ, and every now and then speak about it and speak words? I just think that's an incredible thing to think about. And to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always, making mention you of you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective. And I think that's an interesting word. Paul probably already knows that, it's good, that it is effective. But he's saying more, that I hope and I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become even more effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. For I have come to much joy and comfort in your love. See what we do with each other? We have the power to encourage one another and to comfort one another, not to bring hurt, not to uh, hurt hearts and minds, but we have the power as human beings and people who say we believe in Christ to comfort and to bring joy and demonstrate peace. I have come... I have, I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. We bring refreshment or we bring strong and hot hearts to We bring refreshment through our love, our grace, and our interactions and how we treat one another with love. Therefore, I have enough confidence in Christ. And this is where Paul, I love how Paul writes because the, 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 not the direction so much, but the tone shifts a moment. Okay? He's praising him. Then he says this, Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do 
that which is proper. Yet, for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul the agent, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. He says, you know, my authority, as the great apostle, he recognizes that he is a great authority. Not in arrogance, but in fact because of the power of Christ in him. But he's also in prison, so he really doesn't have much power. But he also knows that Philemon respects and Paul is great. But he says, I appeal to you. Since Paul's urgency, writing from a prison, I appeal to you. And how this is received by Philemon. I appeal to you for my child, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, Onesimus, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and me. He's describing the fact that I know that this guy was your slave. Not only was he useless as a person because the slave was not considered a person, but also because of how he treated you. He stole from you and ran from you. He was useless to you. But now, he is useful. Hmm, what has happened? What's going through Philemon's mind? All of a sudden, something's changed here. Useful to both you and me. And I have sent him back to you in person. That is, this is an incredible statement. That is sending my very heart. This useless scoundrel, slave, a thief, now represents Paul's heart. That's a phenomenal statement to make. That this individual now represents who Paul is and sending his very heart. Whom I wish to keep with me. <laughs> I, would, I would rather have him stay with me. And did anybody ever have a friend that left you? That went away, called away to a, uh, another job, another territory, another place, and then you get... They, you wish they could stay with you, stay close by. If you've been here long enough, you, I've introduced my good friend, Glenn Johnson, the guy that I played baseball with here at LC a long, long time ago, who now lives over in Moses Lake. And every Sunday morning, every Sunday morning, he texts me that he's praying for me. He's been up since about five. He works at the church. He sets the place up, gets all the lights, the AC on, the heat, and gets it ready. Just part of the ministry. It's his service to that church. But he takes the time to encourage me. He ministers to me. But that friend of mine, I love the fact that he's close. And Paul wishes that this once slave scoundrel kind of guy, now fellow brother, could stay with him. Whom I wish to keep with me, that in your behalf he might minister to me in my prison for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything that your goodness should not be as it were by compulsion, but of your own free will. Real effective faith journeys, real effective demonstration of our faith is not done because we have to. Not done to demonstrate that I'm following a set of guidelines, but it is done out of genuine love and gratitude towards a, towards a, a Savior who has saved us. Genuine love speaks volumes without ever really speaking. Genuine love treats people with dignity and respect and understands how important it is to do so. Even those who what? Wrong us. And in some cases, especially those who wrong us. That's a hard lesson that Scripture is very, very firm about. That we are given an incredible responsibility, privilege, and honor to represent Christ through how we love, how we treat one another how we safeguard each other's emotions and hearts and souls and minds. Which is why I go back to this other part of this, uh, of this uh, book, and that is our home is our church. Our home is our church. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm both struck with conviction about that, because there were times when, uh, when the kids were younger that it didn't represent a church, because of my own selfishness, my own passion. It didn't represent the love of Christ. It hurt to start to do times. But it is our church. And the only way that we can represent Christ effectively to the world is by loving well. By loving very, very well those who are lost and our brothers and our sisters. Perhaps he was for this reason, verse 15. Perhaps he was for this reason parted from you for a while, that you should have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave. A beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you? Wow. This guy that I'm sending back to you is coming back different. He's coming back no longer a slave, 
but he's coming back to you as a brother, a fellow believer. And what I think is incredible is that he is a beloved brother, especially to Paul. And then he kind of plants this little plot in Philemon that says, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord, that this guy comes back to Philemon. He's planting the seed of, you, you need to be ready to forgive. You need to be ready to extend your hand of forgiveness to this once slave who treated you wrongly. So in other words, I think what's interesting is Paul is not, in, in, a, in an encouraging way, challenging Philemon, as he challenges you and I each and every day, to demonstrate your genuine faith and belief in Christ by loving others. A couple weeks ago, I talked about this with gentleness, peacefulness, godliness. That is important in our witness to others and how we treat others in our church, here and in our homes. If then, in verse 17, if then you regard me a partner, which remember, he is a fellow worker with Paul. If then you regard me as a partner, accept him as you would me. But if he was wrong, if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. Paul understands the depth of the sin of Onesimus. He understands that he is wrong to him. He's not treating this lightly and not treating grace like a dispensing tool or a dispensing machine. It is real and he understands it. But he will tell you, you can charge it to my account, is what Paul is saying. Whatever he has taken, whatever he is wrong, whatever the amount is, let me deal with it. Then he writes and shifts gears again, which I'd like to shift to. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. He wants to understand that he is writing this. I will repay it. And in comments or in parentheses, lest I should mention to you that you owe to me even your own self as well. Isn't that classic? He's building him up, saying, hey, you know, I do this on your own account. Please, I appeal to you. I don't want to command you to do it, but let me remind you about this important fact. It was my witness, my testimony that saved even your own self. Just a good reminder about our walk with Christ. Verse 20. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you and the Lord. Now, refresh my heart in Christ. This is where it's important. That follows on the heel, on the heels of Paul telling uh, Philemon that I hope you will forgive me. I hope you will accept him back. Then it's, yes, brother, please refresh me with your love through this action. One of the themes of this letter is that when we forgive, when we extend grace and love to others, we refresh those who are around us. We refresh others. Think about that. That when we reach out in love to others, when we, when we reach out and we forgive other people who have wronged us, or people who just need the encouragement to be loved well, we refresh others around us in a profound way. How many of you are gardeners? Good. I have a garden struggle. Would you please come to my house? And start? <laughs> Actually, I have a great garden because Jennifer takes great care of it. But I've been planting little flowers, and we've got one flower. It's a sunflower that won't be one of the big ones. What? This is just—it's a regular sunflower. Any bigger? Yeah. The dwarf, a dwarf sunflower. It'll probably get to be about this tall. Okay. And I loved it. I, I, first of all, I don't like big sunflowers. They just are obnoxious looking when they get big and they can. They just kind of flop over. I need to see. But this little guy I really like. And every morning I look out there and I see the poor dude. <laughs> He's like this. He's just, I'm tired, man. Uh, I'm spent. The sun is hot. And I go out and I want to just pour water in it. So I do. Refreshing him. I don't know what his name is yet, but he's going to get a name. Especially if he hangs in there. But when we forgive one another, when we create a bond of peace through loving one another, we refresh others around us. This happens in our church. Here and in our homes. Those of you who have been married longer than a day know what it's like to be faced with the need to ask for forgiveness and to grant for forgiveness and how much peace that brings. And everybody in your care feels it. Feels it in a profound way. I remember a long time ago uh, when Jennifer and I were at Warner Alliance. 
which is the hostage. And we were going down with a group of men from uh, Orchards Community Church to Boise for a prosecutor's so conference. First one I've ever gone to. Loading up a big bus. The night before, guess who had an argument? I was right. <laughs> Jennifer and I. I mean, it was intense. It was absolutely. Anybody ever have that if you've been married? Anybody ever an intense argument? Thank you for raising your hand and making me not feel alone. <laughs> Chris raised her hand really quick, but Buzz did not raise it. <laughs> <laughs> but we were into an argument that was one of those, golly, it's just awful. And who could hear that? Four little critters living in our house. They heard it. They heard it. They felt like this guy. My son, Flower, out in the, in the, uh, in the garden. Okay. I stormed out of the bed. I went in the, in the bathroom and took a shower. I don't know why I took a shower, but I think God prompted that. Because I went into the shower and it was water, warm water, that soothed my body and my heart. And I knew I was wrong. And I knew I needed to go in and ask for forgiveness. When I was all done, I went into our bedroom. I kneeled down with Jennifer and I just said, I'm so sorry. I'm absolutely wrong. Will you forgive me? Did. Who felt that peace the next day? Who felt the refreshments of the people that are in their house supposedly loving one another in Christ's name now really living it out and able to say I love you and mean it because there was a, an actual visible, visible demonstration of that love. Paul is saying that when, when uh, Philemon greets Onesimus Revive me with your joy. Fill me up with joy and love by forgiving him and welcoming him back into your service. An impossible sending back to me. That's what we're called to escape to, to encourage those that we are closest to. To love those that we're closest to. There's an old song, in, you know, I don't remember the rock and roll band, but somebody might, made a few might remember this. Love the one you're with. Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. Love the one you're with. Whoever you're with, love them well. There's also some sayings that say that we always hurt the ones that we're closest to. We hurt those that we say we love. Real, genuine love that can only can emanate out of this feeble body. It cannot emanate out of this tent that, that falls short. It can only come from the presence of God, being in the presence of the Holy Spirit. In communion with Him so that I can love well, not just my wife, but my kids and my grandkids, but also others around us, my neighbors, etc. Can't do it in my flesh. We hurt in the flesh. Paul is saying, make my joy and my love complete by loving this brother of ours well. When we leave here and we walk out into this world again, we will need to love. And we cannot do it on our own. We cannot get on our knees and ask for forgiveness on our own. We can obey. Out of obedience, we need to forgive and ask for forgiveness. And then when that happens in our, up here, it leads its way right down into our heart. It takes deep root. But we are called to forgive. We are called to love well and to demonstrate that love and how we live out our journey in our life. The themes of Philemon. Let's finish it off. Sorry. Jennifer said, always finish this last part because it's a good one. Having confidence in your obedience. Interesting when I just mentioned obedience. Having confidence in your obedience to obey God's commands to love well. To obey God's commands to draw near to Him so He can draw near to us. For husbands, I'm going to speak to us as in general. Husbands, God has placed a greater mantle on your shoulders, on our shoulders to love well treat with dignity and respect that spouse of ours, our children. It's a greater responsibility. It doesn't mean our wives do not have responsibility, but we, Bruce, you and I, Buzz, everybody else and our husbands, have a greater responsibility to love as well. If you're like me, you fail that at times. Sometimes for long chunks of time. With a hardened heart. And it is only a hardened heart that can be softened by the grace, the forgiveness, and the incredible power of the loving God. So that we can love God. 
for the weekend. And that comes and begins with obedience. We hear that. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. Don't you like that encouragement? I know that you're going to do more than I ever thought of. Whatever I have said, you're going to do more. That's such a great subconscious planting in, this, in, in, in uh, Philemon's mind. I know you're going to do more because you're a good man. You're a Christian man. You're a Christian person. And you will do more than I could ever imagine because Christ is in you. And at the same time, also prepare me for lodging. For I hope that through your prayers, I shall be given to you. Please remember, your prayers are vitally important. Prayer changes things. That's what Chris was talking about. Prayer changes things. Paul, uh, Paul is telling Philemon, because of your prayers, I hope to be released. Because of your prayers, because of your prayers, this young family sits with this beautiful little girl named Memphis with her other daughter Cheyenne. With grandma and grandpa and cousins and aunt and uncles and all that kind of stuff. Because we prayed for them when they were states apart from each other. Michelle with Memphis, clear down in Texas. Bruce and Cheyenne clear up here and back and forth from time to time, not knowing what was going to happen with this little gal. And there she'd be. Do you never, never doubt the power of your prayers. Because they are powerful. Paul is telling Philemon, keep praying because because of your prayers, I will be released. I will be able to come and have lodging with you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you. As do Mark, Aristocrat, Aristocrat, Demas, Luke, who is the uh, physician and the evangelist who wrote Luke, my fellow workers. The grace, remember what, how we began this? In the first paragraph, first couple verses, the same way he ends it. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. I'll read that one more time. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. It is at the spirit's essence that genuine faith resides. May the grace and the love of our Savior be with your spirit so that you can love God. So that you can obey. You want to obey. And we do it out of not surely out of obedience, but we do it out of love. One for others, but out of our love for our God. We cannot do it when we are not in this presence. On the knees of our heart. Seeking His forgiveness. Seeking uh, others' forgiveness. And opening ourselves up to the presence, the very presence of our God. We just read a book in the Bible today. <laughs> Next week we will tackle Deuteronomy. <laughs> or Leviticus. One of those two will tackle the Lord Actually, Judges would be a fun one to go through because we could just say, watch Bill Haynes' life over the years of, of living, which was, God, I'm with you. Oh, I'm falling. God, I'm with you. Oh, I'm falling. That's exactly what Judges is all about, man. I love you all. <laughs> because it's been a joy to serve with you for these last eight, nine years, you have encouraged so many people over the years. This little church is mighty. You've done some incredible things. I think of all the families in the, the bowling for blessings and, at Christmas time. That we've blessed probably close to 75 families with gift food baskets and, and presents and things like that. We've helped people who are in human sex trafficking. I, I, you know, I think about that when Johanna did that walk. I think about, I wonder who was changed because of your faithfulness and the faithfulness of this community. In fact, I think that might have been the first time I met you when you came up with, with Lois to give you that up somehow. I just got lost for a moment. Okay? Mm -hmm. You are an incredible group of people. You really are. I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of that poem. And me and Poma, me and Poma ain't very good neighbors. I can't remember them all the time, yeah? And I'll, maybe I'll read it next week. So come back next week and hear it. Yeah, yeah I'll send it to you. Thank you for the privilege of serving you. Thank you for filling up Jennifer and I's hearts. Thank you for how you minister amongst yourselves and with one another and to others outside the walls of the church. I want to thank you college kids that are in my classes that don't, you probably get tired of hearing because you still come here. Okay. 
can't tell you how you encouraged me by being here. For those of you who call this home, who serve, thank you. Because you have made my joy, Jennifer's joy, very real to me. This week, when you walk out this, this door, from the moment you leave, it's going to get hot on you. Okay? Actually, Beth said, I think you should preach hell and fire and brimstone today. It's hot outside, man. When we walk out, guess what's out there? The enemy. Not that he's not living in here, but he's out there. And in order to love well, to serve well, and to be the representatives that Christ calls us to be, we need to be in his presence. So that those closest to us feel loved, are treated with disrespect, respect, and dignity. And that the world sees something different because of who Christ is in you, in action. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for this time, this day in which we were able to sing. And it had incredible worship time. The song of being in your presence, God. There's no better place. And it's in your presence, not our flesh, but in your presence that we can be empowered, refreshed, and reminded of your love for us so that we might love others as well. God, I pray for every person in here, their families and people who aren't here as well. That as we leave this building, we do not leave your presence, but that we walk out back out into the world under your power, with your power, to love those closest to us well and those that come in contact with us so that they might see something different. God, may you raise up our hearts, encourage our hearts. And Father, as your word says, Lord, we ask you to rebuke the enemy out of our lives out of the presence of our families, out of the presence of our communities and our country, and out of this world. God, only you can do that. And Father, we lift up again each and every one of your faithful servants. That is each of us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Have an awesome day today. Jordan is in the back with letters that kind of point to, uh, point out information about